Then Ms. Amanda Paul. Ms. Amanda Paul is a policy analyst and program executive and administrator of the EPC programs on EU's eastern neighborhood and Turkey and the Eurasia uh, region at the European Policy Center. Ms. Paul is a specialist in geopolitical and foreign policy. She writes twice a week uh, uh, columns for the Turkish Daily on issues related to Turkey, Russian foreign policy, and the Eurasian region. She also has contributed to various numerous other uh, periodicals, including the Financial Times, the European Observer, the Cave Post, and the New European, and provides expert commentary on BBC, Al Jazeera, uh, CNN, CNBC, and Deutsche Welle. And therefore, I welcome her uh, to, uh, to, to give us the European, a, a European perspective, or an European perspective. Please. It's really a pleasure to be here today, and I'd like to thank the organisers uh, for inviting me. Uh, I'm also happy to be representing uh, the female sex in today's conference, because I believe I'm actually the only uh, lady speaker. So, <laughs> so I'm going to try and give you a brief insight into Ukraine-EU um, relations. Ukraine is clearly the most important country in the EU's Eastern Partnership. It's the biggest, it's the most influential, it's a country that has the most uh, potential. But unfortunately, Ukraine is also a country that is very vulnerable. It is a divided country, and it's exactly these divisions uh, that make the country um, even more vulnerable. Many people say that uh, Russia is the enemy um, of Ukraine, or Ukraine's biggest uh, problem. I would actually say that Ukraine is actually the worst enemy of itself, and it's Ukraine itself that has contributed to the slow transformation uh, of the country over the last 20 years. I think it's clear that what happens in Ukraine has a direct impact on the European Union. Crisis and instability in Ukraine affect this entire region. At the same time, historically, Ukraine and the EU have had what I like to call a dialogue of the death. On the one side, you have Ukraine saying that they chose Europe or the EU as its geostrategic choice, talking uh, incessantly about getting a membership perspective and how they have a right to be part of the EU. And on the other side, you have the EU that's done pretty much everything it could do to avoid giving Ukraine uh, a membership perspective. I think we all know today that EU-Ukraine relations are going through a very rough patch which unfortunately risks deteriorating still further. For the most part, most of this trouble has been created uh, by Ukraine itself. Ukraine has dug, or Ukraine's leadership I should say, has dug itself into a very big hole uh, which seems to be getting uh, bigger. Unfortunately, many in the EU uh, have manipulated this situation and used it for their own interests. In fact, I would say that bashing Ukraine's leadership has actually become a popular pastime. <laughs> Talking about sanctions and isolation gets you lines in newspapers. Some people who have never worked on Ukraine or who, not, who know nothing about Ukraine are these days contributing to this debate. Of course, nobody is denying that the backslide in democracy and other problems are extremely worrying. But I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that Ukraine is not a dictatorship. Ukraine is not Belarus. And I think the recent comments from uh, Angela Merkel were extremely unfair. I think they also re reflect perhaps Germany's um, agenda with other countries in this region. And of course, I'm not just picking out Angela Merkel, but there are other, other politicians or political parties uh, who I could also say have also followed this, this line. The EU has been left very disappointed by Ukraine's apparent inability to listen to its concerns. Ukraine doesn't seem to understand that adherence to EU values, democracy and the rule of law are necessary in order to further deepen ties. But again, it, the, the European Union is giving the message now that it considers uh, Ukraine's uh, talk about the threat that's coming from Russia to be exaggerated and it's not really interested uh, in this. It's also getting tired of hearing uh, Ukraine's argument that Ukraine is so geo geostrategically important, all of our arguments should be put to the side. This is also not the correct road uh, 
for Ukraine to go down. The situation is particularly tragic because Ukraine has been a beacon of democracy in this region. It's been a significant factor in the deepening of the EU's policies towards the eastern neighbourhood, which have progressively increased over time. Of course, Ukraine still remains the leader of all the Eastern Partnership countries. It has implemented more legislation than any of the, any of the others, but if the continuing, continuing situation vis-à-vis -vis democracy in Ukraine uh, continues, this situation uh, could soon change, and countries like Moldova or even Georgia uh, could, could find themselves passing by Ukraine. It's obvious that the main reason for the deterioration uh, which have become increasingly politicised, is principally a consequence of the situation vis-à-vis -vis Yulia uh, Tymoshenko. We all know there's plenty of other cases out there, but the EU have chosen to focus, I would say, primarily on the case of Yulia Tymoshenko. This has now been linked to the signing of the association agreement and deep comprehensive free trade agreement that EU and Ukraine have been negotiating for the last five years. For this document to be signed, Ukraine needs to put an end to selective justice and improve rule of law and democracy. Ukraine has recently relaunched its reform process, which has been stalled for quite some time. And while this has been acknowledged uh, in Brussels, most EU politicians are simply not interested. It's sort of been brushed under the carpet uh, Simple focus has just been continually placed on Yulia Tymoshenko, far more so than actually in Ukraine, where I think many Ukrainians are actually more interested in other more pressing economic and social issues. Just on the opposition, I don't always think the opposition um, are playing a constructive role. A number of unnecessary moves concerning blocking legislation that was, which was fruitful towards these EU reforms has been blocked in the RADA for no particular reason, including vis-à-vis -vis the visa uh, liberalisation plan. I think Ukrainians are pretty much just tired of all politicians in Ukraine. What Ukraine really needs uh, is a new generation uh, of leaders, but so far there are very few signs of this actually happening. What we have is old leaders being regurgitated year after year. I also believe that the boycott of Euro 2012 by many people is particularly unwise. It's simply serving to undermine the positive image of the EU amongst ordinary Ukrainians. Many of these Ukrainians simply cannot understand why the EU is linking politics to sport and trying to ruin uh, this special occasion for them. However, there are some, some sort of glimmers of hopes. Following recent developments, including the fact that Mrs. Timoshenko is now under the supervision of a German doctor, and the recent promises made by Ukraine's Prime Minister, Mr. Azarov, to the President of the Parliament, Martin Schulz, has given some people in Brussels a glimmer of hope. Mr. Azarov committed to allowing Mr. Schulz to send an independent medical team and a legal expert who, according to the Prime Minister, will have access to the Timoshenko dossier and be able to closely monitor progress. There are also rumours, and of course you have many rumours in Ukraine, but this particular rumour is focused on a new law that is apparently going to the RADA, which would allow Mrs Timoshenko to be treated outside the country. This would also be viewed in Brussels as a positive step. However, at the same time, next week, there's going to be a new European Parliament resolution uh, condemning... Uh, Ukraine. Clearly Ukraine needs to show that it's committed now to the things that it's promised to the President of the European Parliament and try to start moving forward in a coherent and a constructive way. Can Ukraine get back onto the right track? I think the most important things now is that Ukraine starts to take the appropriate steps to demonstrate a greater commitment to democracy, the rule of law and to bring an end to politically motivated cases. It's clear that the 28th of October parliamentary elections are going to be a litmus test and they have to meet international standards. This election is clearly going to be one of the most monitored probably in the history of Ukraine. If Ukraine fails to move into this direction, it's likely the association agreement will remain unsigned and worse still, Ukraine may become further isolated.
such a strategy from the EU, if you can actually call it a strategy, is certainly not shared by all member states. I would probably say perhaps three quarters of EU member states don't support this strategy. But as we all know, the EU is a club that works on unanimity, uh, and this is life. So then you could say what would happen to Ukraine's relations with the EU if you don't have the association agreement signed. Well, actually, beyond all the political difficulties at the moment, at a technical level, business is still going on quietly and productively, with the EU and Ukraine having a significant level of cooperation on many different sectors. This includes energy, transport, mobility, aviation, the fight against terror terrorism and organised crime, and regional issues. Ukraine is presently negotiating a visa-free regime with the EU. This is something that's very tangible and so far has been unaffected by the Timoshenko issue, which I think is very important. And in terms of European security, Ukraine has been one of the most active non-EU countries in the EU CFDP. It aligns itself with approximately 90% of EU statements. Ukraine has been part of the Atlanta piracy operation in Somalia. It's contributed to the Libya crisis and it also took part in the police mission in Bosnia-Herzegovina. And in July 2011, the Ukrainian naval forces joined the Greek-led European Union battle group, Helbrock, on a six-month standby duty. Ukraine is only the third country after Turkey and Norway to be involved in such an operation. And last but not least, Ukraine is also an important and valuable regional actor. It plays an important role in the solution of the Transnistrian conflict and is due to take over the chairmanship of the OSCE in 2013. What they're going to do with this chairmanship, of course, still remains to be seen, and it will be interesting to see this. But still, the optimal outcome would be for Ukraine and the EU uh, to sign this association agreement. I don't doubt that, and I personally strongly support it. It should be used as a tool to continue to engage with Ukraine. Ukraine made a lot of concessions whilst negotiating this agreement, which should not be overlooked, and it will represent something very tangible for society. Particularly the trade agreement can be implemented much more quickly once it's ratified in the European Parliament, because it doesn't need to have the ratification of all the member states before it, it kicks into life. This would have a big impact on the business community as it provides the EU and Ukraine uh, with common rules and standards, which I think would be very positive once adopted. And of course, bringing these two agreements to life would immediately relieve some of the pressure um, from Russia vis-à-vis -vis the Customs Union, Euro-Asian Union and any other ideas the Russians may have uh, cooked up by then. Leaving the agreement unsigned also risks the possibility of having to renegotiate it at some other point in the future, because if Ukraine was to come under a new leader, the new leader could decide he doesn't like this text, we want a new text, and again that could be another four or five years which would bring us back to square zero. So just to conclude, I would like uh, to state that I would agree with the recent statement by the Foreign Minister of Lithuania, Mr. Azubalis. He has said that isolating Ukraine is not the answer. Ukraine needs to be engaged, the opposition needs to be encouraged to cooperate and a proper strategy needs to be formulated because the Ukraine needs to give some sort of perspective to its citizens and it's the job of the EU uh, to help this along the way. Ukrainians deserve it. The alternative will only contribute to an increasingly unpredictable and unstable Ukraine, a Ukraine that will possibly be looking far more for closer ties with the Euro-Asia region, which is certainly not in the benefits uh, of Europe. This would only serve to undermine stability and security in this entire region. Foreign Minister Abulitz is certainly not the only leader to share this sentiment. Thank you. Um, I think you've heard from Ambassador Herbst uh, that uh, he was one of the architects of a very uh, sophisticated policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine in that very important period between 2002 and 2007 and 2008. Uh, 
during the, the, the high days of, uh, of the Orange Revolution as well. Um, he, is, he truly is one of Ukraine's best friends in, in Washington, uh, Mr. Damon Wilson. Uh, Mr. Damon Wilson is the Executive Vice President of the Atlantic Council at this point. He also served as, as the, um, serves as the Senior Advisor to the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council previously. He served as Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for European Affairs at the National Security Council, where he did an enormous amount of work that I just mentioned. His other, his other government positions have included Chief of Staff and Executive Secretary at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, uh, Director for Central, Eastern, and Northern European Affairs at the National Security Council, and it, in fact, because he's going to be giving us what amounts to a NATO perspective on Ukraine's strategic position um, in contemporary times. He was the direct Deputy Director of Private Office of NATO General Secretary Lord Robinson. So for a NATO perspective, I don't think we can get anybody better than Damon Wilson, another A for this particular panel. Thank you very much, Walter, for that kind introduction. I want to thank the organizers for putting this conference together. I'm delighted to be here with some terrific colleagues on this panel for this conversation about NATO and NATO-Ukraine, a conversation that there we haven't heard much about NATO-Ukraine in a while. Um, and as Walter mentioned, uh, I've had the opportunity to work on nearly every NATO summit since 1999. Um, and so I just wanted to take a moment this afternoon uh, to offer some thoughts on the way forward with NATO-Ukraine and a couple of things. I'll try to offer a little bit of a NATO perspective, but my essential theme to my conversation will be the essential link between the strategic, the link between NATO, aspirations for NATO membership, and the domestic, the internal, what happens inside Ukraine. Ukraine. It is an extremely direct link, which many often in the Ukrainian government want to ignore. And my premise will be that this issue although not really on the agenda day today, it should be. Because in my view, Ukraine is a linchpin to European security and stability. And as long as Ukraine's security, as long as Ukraine's future remains ambiguous, ambivalent, I think we have the potential for real instability in Europe. And this is something we want to put behind. behind. Um, and I see NATO Ukraine as a path to that. So as Walter said, I've been working on NATO issues. I've worked at the State Department, uh, worked at the White House, and I thought that I would start this conversation with a little bit of a, a, tale, of, a tale of two summits, if I may. A tale of two summits. The, uh, the 2008 Bucharest summit, the summit at NATO that actually took place closest to Ukraine in terms of geography, and the 2012 Chicago summit, a summit taking place in a city but it probably has the largest Ukrainian population of any summit that's hosted a, a, a NATO uh, event before. Yes, kudos to you. And so unfortunately, Chicago was designed to be a summit about NATO Ukraine because you're here. But unfortunately, I think because of where Ukraine today is, it's not. <clears throat> so the tale of two summits. I, uh, I was working on Ukraine at the White House uh, in the wake of the Orange Revolution, uh, where we were moving forward very aggressively, very robustly on a policy of support for transformation of the country, and where we began to really consider serious discussions about NATO uh, and Ukraine, and began a conversation about whether we wanted to support Ukraine in a membership action plan. I was trying to work this very acutely at the White House, uh, and one of the ways we began to try to push this forward um, was over an incident where I almost lost my job because of Ukraine at the White House. In 2006, as Ambassador Herbst knows, we began to plan a visit of President Bush to Ukraine because we thought it was critical to get an American president on the ground into Ukraine, deliver a message of support in the wake of the Orange Revolution. We had one problem, that Timoshenko and Yushchenko were bickering among themselves. So we went very quietly behind the scenes and we said, look, we know you've got problems, we know you've got issues. But if you get your act together, you form a government together in time, we're going to deliver the President of the United States for a major visit, a major statement of American support, and wind in your sails for domestic reforms, and a push towards uh, your aspirations to move closer to NATO. Pretty big stuff to offer the leadership of Ukraine. Not enough. They failed. 
They couldn't form a government. We had to cancel the visit. I almost lost my job for having put the president's uh, reputation on the line, and we ended up going to Hungary. It was a great visit, but it was a lost opportunity. That's too much of the story, a lost opportunity in Ukraine. I left the White House and went to Iraq for a year. Um, when I left the White House, Ukraine had been really at the center of our discussion. I came back a year after being in Baghdad, quite detached from Ukrainian issues, if you, if you, as you can understand, and I was surprised at how far Ukraine had fallen off the agenda. I found this very disturbing. So we actually set out to begin a process in December of 2007, January 2008, saying we have a NATO summit around the corner. And we thought two years before that Georgia, that Ukraine, that these would be major issues on the summit, but they really aren't right now. We aren't in that situation. And we began our serious uh, process inside the White House to figure out, is this something we need to pick up? We've been disappointed. We've had concerns. There have been real difficulties with Ukraine, Georgia as well. And a couple things happened. One, Yushchenko, Yatsenyuk, Tomashenko came together and signed a joint letter uh, and made a formal request to the alliance uh, to ask for a membership action plan officially putting that, in, uh, that ball in NATO's court. And we ran a very serious process at the White House of soul searching with our cabinet, with the president, uh, to figure out if this, where US policy needed to go. And despite a lot of reservation among many US officials, a lot of reservation among European officials, the president decided that we had to lean forward. If Ukraine asked for a membership action plan, we needed to be prepared to say yes. This wasn't membership after all. This was beginning the path towards membership. And if a country asks, if a country is willing to make the transformation of its own society to join what uh, I think Valentin said is not just a military alliance, but alliance of values, a political alliance, then we need to be prepared to say we're going to stand by your side and help you in that process. But we also had another factor in play. And the president at the time thought, this isn't a certain outcome. We may have a particular historic window of opportunity right now that may be it may not last, and therefore we have, it's incumbent upon us as policymakers in the West to try to push and support those Ukrainians that want to push Ukraine through that window of opportunity. And so we leaned forward. We, we, we did this very quietly because we knew of European opposition. We ran an intensive campaign of trying to work to bring European leaders on board, focusing in particular at the end of the day on Chancellor Merkel in Germany. But we decided to show our cards by going on the offense. And we finally planned that visit of a U.S. president to Kyiv. And it was, a US, it was a visit that we very intentionally attached to a, a, president, a visit of the president of the United States to Ukraine on the eve of a NATO summit to send an unambiguous signal of U.S. support for Ukraine's NATO aspirations, at which the president delivered a strong statement in support of that. And we went into, we went into the Bucharest summit without having an agreement, but ready to go into battle. Um, as you all know, that didn't come out so well in many respects. We failed to build a consensus within the alliance for a membership action plan for Ukraine. But much to our surprise, the alliance did decide in Bucharest that Ukraine will become a member of NATO. Now, that's a pretty dramatic statement. It's a pretty solid statement. And that, that statement exists not because the Americans and Germans came to a compromise. We actually failed in our negotiations to come to a compromise. But as we were failing, Ukraine's friends in Central Europe stood up and said, this isn't good enough. We're not ready to let this just fall off the table. This isn't just an alliance between the United States and Germany where the big guys get to decide. This is about our security. Ukraine matters. And it was Poland and Romania and the countries in Central and Eastern Europe that pushed the alliance to come forward with a pretty dramatic statement that Ukraine will become a member of NATO. So where are we now? Four years later, 2012, that 2008 summit, Ukraine was at the center of that discussion. It was dramatic. It was exciting. And Ukraine was in the midst of it. I've just come this morning, I uh, apologize, you could see I was late this morning. I've just come this morning from the NATO summit here. We hosted NATO Secretary General Rasmussen. We're running a parallel summit with young leaders from across the alliance and its partners. And what's striking to me as I've been working on the Chicago summit is Ukraine's off the agenda. What a tragedy. We're in a city with the largest Ukrainian population. Uh, this is where we should be talking about it. Didn't come out of the Secretary General's mouth once. I've been working with governments in the lead up to this summit. I myself published a big piece on how to continue NATO enlargement last week. Um, and Ukraine's not part of that discussion. So why does this matter? This isn't just about NATO enlargement or Ukraine. This is about a vision. 
It's about a vision of a Europe that's whole, free, and at peace. And for us, the process of NATO enlargement is the vehicle that helps deliver on that vision. Enlargement, at the end of the day, it makes Europe more stable. It makes NATO stronger. It's not just about the extension of a military alliance. It's about the integration in the community of values in the transatlantic community. It's about political identity, as Valentin said. Um, and as we've seen in the past, oftentimes NATO enlargement preceded, European Union enlargement followed. Much more complex to pursue, its path, pursue a path into the EU. So the reality is that door actually remains open to Ukraine, but Ukraine's not particularly interested right now. So I think that's the challenge facing us. It wasn't all that, always that way. Let me just give you an example of, of thinking how NATO-Ukraine relations have evolved. Ukraine was in there in 91, shortly after its independence, in this North Atlantic Cooperation Council with NATO. It was the first of the Commonwealth of Independent States to join the Partnership for Peace in 1994. In 1996, it deployed forces into Bosnia with NATO. In 97, we forged a charter on distinctive partnership that set up a NATO-Ukraine uh, uh, commission to show how important and special and unique this relationship was. In 99, we had Ukrainian forces deploying with the Poles into Kosovo. In 2002, Coach Kuchma, President Kuchma, for the first time, articulated a goal of NATO membership, and we launched a new action plan towards that end. Um, we began a series of, of trust funds for the Ukraine to help them destroy landmines, small arms, manpads, practical cooperation to assist Ukraine's defense cooperation. And President Yushchenko, in 2005, we launched what we called an intensified dialogue on membership issues, a new step on Ukraine's path towards the alliance. In 2007, Ukraine joined Operation Active Endeavor, a, a, a naval patrol in the Mediterranean, sent a medical team to join a provincial reconstruction team in Afghanistan. Ukraine was part of NATO's mix. And in 2008, Ukraine asked for a membership action plan. Bucharest agreed, without agreeing on a map, agreed that Ukraine would become a member. And then what happened? President Yanukovych returned to power in 2010, declared Ukraine's non-bloc status. First of all, I don't know what that means. Non-bloc status. This isn't the Cold War. <laughs> we don't think in blocks anymore. Sweden, Sweden itself, Sweden, the epitome of a neutral country during the Cold War, doesn't call itself neutral anymore. It was the idea. The the <laughs> so, right now, NATO-Ukraine relations they exist. There is real cooperation, practical cooperation. It matters, but in some respects, we're going through the motions because the defense reforms inside the ministry have stalled to some degree. Corruption is becoming more endemic, undermining some of that cooperation. But most importantly, the strategic direction is gone. So what's at stake? It's not just Ukraine-NATO, but more is at stake. Ukraine's democracy. It's actually Ukraine in the West, Ukraine in Europe. So if I might, I want to go back to my premise that NATO, the discussion of NATO-Ukraine, the strategic discussion, is intimately linked to internal developments inside Ukraine, the domestic. So we all here in this room share a vision. It's an independent, sovereign Ukraine with strong democratic institutions and rule of law, with a prosperous free market that's embedded in Europe, a partner of the United States, and at peace with its neighbor, Russia. Yet 20 years after independence, Ukraine's young democracy, its cultural identity, its weak institutions, they face political manipulation, and its fragile economy is subject to massive distortions of widespread top-down corruption. In short, Ukraine's sovereignty is not guaranteed, its democracy is not inevitable, and its market is not really free. Ukraine today tweet, it, it, it teeters between Eurasian malaise and an ambivalent Europe, as we heard from our last speaker. Ukraine's future is in play. The decisions that are being taken right now will help determine whether Ukraine evolves into a European democracy or whether it descends into a post-Soviet authoritarian kleptocracy. We're at a crossroads. Ukraine is at a crossroads. And much is at stake, I would argue, for the transatlantic community, for the NATO nations. But what we're seeing play out in Ukraine is really a set of contradictory policies. In many respects, the government has very clearly tried to drive forward with integration towards Europe, very effectively negotiating the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, the association agreement with the European Union, while at the same time doing what it can to emasculate its domestic opposition, political opposition. It's actually made progress on both of these objectives. You have an EU treaty that's ready to be signed, and you've got Timoshenko and Lutsenko in jail. <laughs> 
But the reality is, leaders in Ukraine, they must choose. And this choice isn't between Russia and the West. I actually think that's a false choice. The choice is whether Ukraine sees its future in Europe and the European mainstream, or whether it's relegated to the, to the borderlands. There's a choice that this leadership has to take on whether its political preservation is more important than anchoring Ukraine to European institutions, the European Union, and potentially ultimately NATO. Now, we find ourselves where we are today in large part because of the failure of the Orange Revolution. Um, there are no innocents in the story of, of post-Cold War Ukraine. But if you look at what's happened since President Yanukovych has come to power, a couple of things. I mean, yes, he centralized power. And that's not necessarily bad. There was there's a degree of chaos in policy making in Ukraine in the past. Yushchenko Tymoshenko couldn't agree. So he's brought order to chaos. It's actually more, it's been easier to work with the Ukrainian government on certain business issues, on certain issues that have been stalled over the years. We've seen some progress. At the same time, Ukraine, to, in a certain perspective, has, re, has behaved responsibly on the international stage, forging forward with very important agreement with the United States on highly enriched uranium, um, for, moving forward with uh, closer negotiations with the European Union. All in all, it's been a responsible actor on the international stage. But if you look at home, what's happening at home, it's time to sound the alarm. Selective prosecutions of the political opposition, a more restrictive media environment, disturbing involvement of the SBU in, in domestic politics, fundamentally flawed local elections in October 2010, pressure on civil society, erosion of free speech, consolidation of executive power of the judiciary, manipulation of the electoral code, continue, continued rampant corruption. If we wondered what Ukraine would look like, it's now being governed like it's Donetsk. But the vision is not lost. It's not lost. It's not lost because of people like you in this room. It's not lost because of Ukraine's own diversity. Its cultural and political diversity, I think, provides a bulwark against any domination of one force. The civil society is actually pretty vibrant and strong. Your voice is strong on this issue. And so what, as we look forward, there's some tests coming up, tests on how we handle the political prosecutions. I had the honor to be the first, uh, among the first international observers to visit former Prime Minister Timoshenko uh, in prison. Uh, since her transfer to a prison outside Kharkiv a couple of months ago. I was the second international visitor to be able to visit Yuri Lutsenko in a prison in Kyiv. The resolution of these cases is important. It's the test for the government. Second, the October parliamentary elections couldn't be more important. Ukraine actually established a pretty good track record of free and independent elections. Um, the first test under this government, the local elections, was a failure. This one really matters. And third, corruption. Corruption isn't just a problem. It's just not a minor problem. It is a national security challenge in Ukraine for two reasons. The scale of corruption in Ukraine today undermines Ukrainian democracy because it incentivizes people in power not to leave power because what they're doing to those in the opposition, they fear will be done to them. And second, corruption makes Ukraine vulnerable to manipulation by nefarious foreign forces that have alternative motives in mind. So. This means that we need to be able to do a few things. The European Union hold back on the deep and comprehensive association agreement, but we get in there the way Ambassador Herbst was and we give electoral assistance to NGOs in Ukraine right now to help put a spotlight on this country as it heads into parliamentary elections. Um, that we push to see a real vibrant um, energy efficiency and energy sector liberalization strategy because that would be the most effective anti-corruption strategy in Ukraine. And that we actually not cut off NATO-Ukraine relations, but we look to preserve and build NATO-Ukraine relations. That we continue military-to-military -military cooperation. I can't tell you how important during the Orange Revolution, it wasn't very clear to us what would happen in the Orange Revolution. As Ambassador Herbst knows, we feared the outbreak of violence. But the relationships that we had built with the Ukrainian military, with professional Ukrainian military, with the Ukrainian intelligence service, it gave us strong relations at a very delicate time where we could send signals at a critical crisis moment and, and sow enough seed, enough, uh, sow enough doubt in the minds of political leaders in Ukraine that if they had asked their forces to crack down on, on demonstrators, that they couldn't be sure that they would respond. And that's because we actually sustained strong military-to-military -military ties, intelligence ties. So no matter how bad it gets, 
We have to be in the game, forging those relationships, because those relationships can come in handy when things get rough. <clears throat> so as this goes forward, checking democratic backsliding, going on offense to help integrate Ukraine, the people of Ukraine, into Europe. We've got to focus on civil society, people-to-people -people ties right now. And as Ukraine becomes more European, the policy will follow, I think. Continue to help integrate Ukraine globally into, an, uh, into a global economic uh, marketplace that promotes rule of law. And we've got to back Ukraine's sovereignty. Putin's back. Putin's back in the Kremlin as the president. The vision of the Eurasian Union is out there. President Yanukovych, to his credit, has stood up against that vision so far. We have to back them up in that. Because if it's left unchecked, if, if a Russian vision of a Eurasian Union that tries to take back and, and regain control and influence over, these, over Ukraine and its neighbors, if, if that's unchecked, I think it leads to instability and potential conflict. This all matters because Ukraine, Ukraine's a big country, the population of Spain, the landmass of France. The history of instability in Europe is about instability between Germ the land between Germany and Russia. It's about Ukraine. And that's why I think its future relationship, its security relationship to the West, and ultimately its security relationship to NATO is a guarantor for stability in the region. But it's also, I'm going to agree with Ambassador, Hope, Ambassador Herbs, it's also our best hope for change in Russia. Ukraine's, if, Ukraine's, if Ukraine fails, it only validates Putin's view that democracy is dangerous. If Ukraine succeeds, it's a direct challenge to show that Russia's backward cousins in Ukraine, that they can actually succeed. There's a lot at stake here. Ukraine's at a crossroads. Its democracy is in play. Its place in Europe is in play. Its reliability as a partner of the United States is in play. So I think our goal is to figure out in this tough time, how do we actually restore NATO as an objective of Ukrainian policy? It has to be Ukraine's decision, but it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to happen organically because Ukrainians themselves increasingly want this. It depends on political will and leadership. It depends on education to help folks understand what NATO is not. If you're Ukrainian today, you still think of NATO through the Cold War lens. It's about education. And it's about laying the groundwork now so that these, until these policies can be restored. So I think as we go into a NATO summit here in Chicago, where it's going to be clear, NATO will, NATO will validate the open door policy. It will validate its commitment to Bucharest. It will say that enlargement has a future in the alliance. But we don't want that just to be an enlargement vision for the Western Balkans and, and maybe for Georgia, but not Ukraine. Our goal is to figure out how to keep Ukraine in that vision so that we make the commitment of the Bucharest summit, the Ukraine will be a member of NATO, we make that a credible statement and not a joke. Thank you very much. I honestly must say that uh, James Shearer, we call him Sir James, uh, really does not need any introduction. Um, but I will introduce him because I think the crowd ought to know uh, that we have a very distinguished guest who will give us a very interesting perspective. He will not give a European or a native or a U.S. or Canadian or a U.K. perspective. He will give what possibly is a Russian perspective on Ukraine's, Ukraine's strategic uh, uh, situation uh, at, at, at present time. James Shearer is the senior fellow at, uh, at the Russian Eurasian program in the Royal Institute of International Affairs, uh, commonly known as the Chatham House. He is also a member of the Faculty of Social Studies at Oxford University. In addition to uh, regularly advising uh, UK, EU, and NATO and partner countries on Russia, Ukraine, and back sea, Professor Scheer has a long-standing relationship with the defense and security community in Ukraine. I will ask uh, James to uh, now give what is a very interesting perspective for him, the Russian perspective. <laughs> Thank you very much. Walter, although you and I have a long and privileged relationship dating uh, 15 years, um, I never take it for granted to, uh, when you invite me to a conference, I am always honored. 
I am particularly honoured today for the first time to have the opportunity to acquaint myself uh, with the um, with the Kharamata, the Ukrainian community in Chicago, uh, to see once again uh, Boris Patapinka from uh, Toronto uh, and to be amongst uh, you all. Walter, there's one thing you did not say in your introduction. You did not say that I am a Russian. Uh, <laughs> and that puts me in an odd and maybe invidious position. I have two pitfalls which I must uh, avoid in giving this talk, and I want to alert you to them. The first is not to give the talk that Sergei Lavrov would give. Uh, I don't think you intended me to tell this audience what Russians would, Russian leadership would like them to think. But the second pitfall is that I must not stand here and be James Sher. My purpose here is to relay as honestly as I can the thinking, the interests, the concerns, and the ambitions um, of the state leadership of the Russian Federation. Um, and I won't ask you not to shoot the messenger. If you want to do that, go ahead. Uh, but I will then reply, probably as James Sher, if you do. It is perhaps unfortunate, but it is not controversial to say that the Ukraine-NATO relationship is more important to Russia than it is to most members of NATO. It is far more controversial to say what I will now say, that that relationship is at least as important, perhaps more important to Russia than it is to Ukraine itself. There are a large number of Ukrainian patriots and professionals who believe it is possible for an extended period of time, possibly forever, for Ukraine to be secure, well defended and prosperous with a relationship with NATO that falls short of membership. There is no one of consequence in Russia who believes that Ukraine's membership of NATO would not be a significant threat to Russia. And whether we like this reality or not, it is reality. Let me explain why. We are looking here at three factors that come together. The first has to do with mainstream Russian views about NATO. For the Russian military establishment, NATO is um, almost genetically, by definition, an anti-Russian military bloc. The only qualifications to this have come from NATO's new threats and challenges outside Europe, globally, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. No one of consequence in Russia took seriously the proposition in the 1990s that NATO was transforming itself in Europe to become uh, something else. Uh, anyone involved, as Damon Wilson has been involved, as I have been involved, with that transformation of NATO in the 1990s knows that one of the principal reasons for the first round of NATO enlargement, which was not only backed but led by Germany, was to ensure that security issues in Central Europe would not be addressed by Germans as Germans but would be addressed collectively by a Euro-Atlantic community. Everyone knows that another purpose of it was to maintain the institutionalized engagement of the United States in the affairs of Europe. Everyone knows that the core reason was to solve an existential problem of the, uh, of, of, of the heritage of the Central European states, to take them finally out of the gray zone and give them absolute certainty that in every single sense they are part of Europe and they are part of the West. No matter how this point has been expressed in Russia, only handfuls of people will understand and be prepared to concede it. And that's where we still are. That's point one. 
Second point about Ukraine itself. There are a large number of Russian liberals, I would dare say the majority of thinking Russian liberals, people who abominate the Putin system, who will say what one of my friends very publicly said. Ukraine is part of my identity as a Russian. Ukraine is for Russians fundamentally an identity issue. Any Russian government, any Russian government we would wish to see, that we could dream about, would quite legitimately want there to be friendly relations between Russia and Ukraine and Russia and its other neighbors. That is not only a legitimate but an essential national interest. And there is nothing wrong with friendly relations between Ukraine and Russia. The problem with the Russian dispensation we face today and have faced for 20 years is that the uh, insistence and the requirement is not simply for Druzhenskia atnashinia, but Bratskia atnashinia, brotherly relations. And that means something very different. And that has always meant subservience. It has always implied a right to be a leading factor not only in external affairs but in internal policy and have a privileged role inside key institutions, uh, including uh, institutions of defense and security. Um, and all of this has been strengthened by a major current of Russian policy, which is commonly today called the civilizational or humanitarian dimension by President Putin's uh, very uh, well-articulated discussion of what the Russian nation means, what Ruski Mir means, uh, in a seminal article of his, Russian Nationalny Vapros, one which reflects a large degree of, his, of, of historical reality, but has major implications for those who Russia permissively describes as compatriots in other countries. This conception of Ukraine is also part of what I would suggest is an unarticulated, broader, overarching view and objective of Russian policy generally. And let me put it in the following way. Let me put the obverse of it first. I don't think it would be controversial in this room if I said the overarching objective of U.S. foreign policy is to maintain an a, a global environment hospitable to the values of liberal democracy. Russia's overarching objective is, I would not say the opposite, but the obverse of this, to create an international environment conducive to the maintenance and prolongation of its system of, of, its system of governance at home, including its security and economic model. Ukraine's orientation is a fundamental internal interest of Russia, not just an external interest of Russia. And the existence of an alternative model, the successful development of a liberal democratic model along Euro-Atlantic lines, is seen under today's dispensation and under that which has existed for much of the past 20 years as a threat to Russia's core interests and identity. And my last point, therefore, my last, my last point before concluding, is that NATO is not... NATO's, NATO's relationship with Ukraine and other former Soviet states is not feared simply because NATO is seen in geopolitical terms as some kind of potential military threat. It is feared because NATO is understood to be a military civilizational force that, when it comes, not only strengthens countries militarily, but transforms their entire model of defense, their entire understanding of how armed forces and security services relate to political authorities, relate to society, uh, to how they, to civil military relations, to how they are conducted. Uh, to the whole scheme of security, to the whole definition of professionalism, uh, 
uh, when one of Damon's colleagues and my dear friend uh, James Green, who ran the NATO liaison office, left, he said, we've reached the stage now where I think we could say that about one third of younger Ukrainian officers in professional terms have more in common with their NATO colleagues than with their Russian colleagues. This is, uh, you know, this is something quite extraordinary. Uh, so when we say, we're not doing this to threaten you, we're not moving bases in, this is all about, you know, we have criteria and it's about democracy and market economies and everything else. We're not reassuring Russians, they're saying, no, that touch. That is what they fear. To wrap up. Uh, even those who think, as I think one's entitled to, that President Putin is now de facto coming into his fourth term and not his third, he's back. These issues matter profoundly to him. Compared to a number of others, compared to his titular predecessor, Dmitry Medvedev, this is an, compared to any statesman in Europe, if you can call them statesmen. Vladimir Putin is not risk averse. He has pursued very high-risk strategies. This is a very high-risk issue. It's a very dangerous issue now because we are at a point where Russia feels in its near abroad, in its immediate neighborhood, very strong. This is because the financial crisis, which has not helped Russia economically at all, it's been very damaging, has in political and psychological terms been an enormous boost to Russia. And obviously, also, for the other reasons we've discussed today, the evident incapacity of Ukraine itself to address these serious issues. That makes Russia today very strong. But he is also aware that Russia is threatened. The threat, can be seen on, the threat can be seen in urban centers. This has come as a shock to them. They have not expected this. The threat can be seen in global energy markets. No one in Russia anticipated the shale gas revolution. They're pursuing a reactive policy. They're pursuing it in their usual way, very aggressively, um, very adroitly, very obliquely, and very well. But all they are doing by this is delaying something which is going to happen. We are looking at Russian assets, strategic assets, which are diminishing. And what Russia is extremely good at is prolonging the life of outmoded thinking and practice. It is very, very bad at changing it. That's what we're looking at. When you put this combination together, when an ambitious power like Russia faces this combination of strength today and long to midterm worry, you're looking at something very dangerous. And this is why I said, and will repeat, that I think Putin's expectation over the next few years is to reach closure with Ukraine. And that is really why it's so disturbing that this issue is not a subject of discussion in Chicago today. Thank you very much. Uh, Alexander Alexandrovich, who I'm going to ask to sp speak for three to five minutes, and I'm asking that as, 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 part, as the first discussant to actually state what he thinks, then, is the uh, government's position. Oh, that looks like. But remember, read it Thank you, Walter. Uh, indeed, it's very hard to, to speak after such eloquent uh, speakers and uh, uh, before their uh, break. Um, I, I thank the organizers of this conference, among which there are a lot of my old friends since my diplomatic job in Washington, D.C., for this invitation. Uh, it would be indeed only natural to hear the view of the Ukrainian government uh, on this important subject. And I will try uh, to explain one subject that has become a little controversial, to put it mildly, uh, namely Ukraine's uh, current non bloc status. I know this term is not uh, popular in this audience, but please bear with me. Uh, please keep your minds open. As the name of this panel goes, Ukraine finds uh, itself in a certain strategic framework against which it has to develop its policies. Contrary to popular belief, I would argue that Ukraine's security environment has not changed much in the last 20 years. This environment is not determined by the false dilemma with the Ukraine east or west, and here I fully uh, concur with Damon 
We have had certain ups and downs in our relationships with the West or with Russia, but at least we can control or influence these relationships. What Ukraine cannot control, however, is the hate or love relationship between Washington and Brussels on the one hand and Moscow on the other. In that sense, the entire European continent is hostage to this relationship. There are basically three ways to mitigate this problem. Countries either join NATO or CSTO, or they try to perform a very delicate balancing act. Ukraine has tried the first two options at various times in its modern history with little success. Because as soon as we move closer to one side, the other side does its best to pull us back. Moreover, in their long-standing opposition, the West and Russia always attempt to engage Ukraine on their respective sides, tearing the fabric of European geopolitics and of the Ukrainian society. Hence, and I wish to emphasize the next point, regardless of the genuine or perceived motives for the actual declaration of its non-bloc policy two years ago, this move could have been expected for some time. This third option, without pretension to be ideal, has never been seriously explored as a modus operandi. However, it has been brooding in the minds of the Ukrainian politicians and reflecting the minds of many Ukrainian people. In this particular light, the non-bloc policy of Ukraine should be viewed as the consequence of Euro-Atlantic dichotomy rather than the cause of the current regional security environment. Ukraine views its security not, not as something that can be guaranteed once and forever by one stroke of a pen on any legal document, but as a building with many different bricks and dimensions. Um, I will speak, uh, skip some of the parts. Uh, so, having proclaimed its policy of non-membership in any military alliances, Ukraine, in the short and medium perspective, intends to provide for its own security by the following means. First, uh, to continue policy of European integration, including, of course, through internal reforms that would enhance its political, economic, energy, humanitarian, and information security. It can be expressed by a simple yet very pers persuasive formula. The best guarantee of non-bloc Ukraine's security is its membership in the European Union. Second, maintaining the policy of strategic equilibrium between its key partners and encouraging sustained rapprochement between Russia and the West. I'm not advocating the infamous slogan into Europe together with Moscow. Rather, the pan-European integration should take place on parallel independent tracks. Applied to NATO, that would mean establishing cooperation in the framework 28 plus 1 plus 1. Third, mitigating the problems of hard security by facilitating the global nuclear disarmament, leading with like-minded Europeans the policy of denuclearization and demilitarization of the continent, in particular by pushing tactical nukes out of the region, reviving CFE, and finding a modus vivendi on missile defense, pursuing confidence-building measures along the uh, perimeter of Ukraine's borders and in the Black Sea area. Um, a more active stance of Ukraine on ESDP, political and military integration with the European Union. Here, the role of NATO is very important since military standards are very similar in both organizations. Last but not least, continuing the distinctive and constructive partnership with NATO, which, by the way, has been more substantial in the last two years. To conclude, I would like to stress just three very, very briefly, but three curious points that have the direct bearing on Ukraine-NATO relationship. First, in many unilateral declar declarations of NATO on Ukraine, including in official written texts, the alliance expresses its strong support of a sovereign, independent, and prosperous Ukraine, its territorial integrity, and the inviolability of its borders. It has been mentioned also by, by many uh, panelists today. Uh, it has become almost a cliché for the speeches of the NATO Secretary General and high officials from the member states. We regard these expressions as an implicit commitment to protect Ukraine against possible contingencies. The language is very similar to that in the Budapest Memorandum and presents explicit political assurances of our security. Second, we may not underestimate the enormous normative power of the European Union and NATO, each having its own set of acquis communautaire. In the case of NATO, those are the uh, NASTAG, Smart Defense and Connected Forces concept, the sluggish but 
unstoppable codification will ensure such a level of integration on the European continent that the issue of membership at some point in future may become irrelevant. And finally, starting from its Lisbon summit, NATO has been slowly but clearly evolving from a purely military alliance into a regional and even global security organization. This transformation may lead to a new situation in Europe, say 15 to 20 years from now. Therefore, I would argue against seeking a permanent neutrality status for Ukraine, uh, but rather keeping all options open. Ukraine in a flux, Ukraine at the edge of two worlds, as it was mentioned by Blotko today, may turn out to be in a more winning position than Ukraine rigidly attached to any security configuration. I will leave you with that as a food for thought before the break. Thank you, Walter. Thank you.